Take your Bible, turn to the book of Daniel, if you would, please. Book of Daniel. God uh, laid this on my heart, and I uh, always pray about what to preach, how to preach it, and sometimes God makes it easy, and sometimes He doesn't, And uh, but I can tell you, just looking at the Word and reading the Word, uh, God's Word says things a lot better than I know that I ever say them. And uh, it was a blessing uh, for me to go through this and uh, study it out for myself. God helped me. I don't think I've ever preached a message from, from Daniel chapter 9. I've got uh, several messages to preach out of this. In fact, it, it just kind of started out uh, how God just kind of brought it to me was uh, in Daniel chapter 9, verse 24, he talks about the 70 weeks that are determined upon thy people. And he talks about there's seven things here that God does. And I was thinking about that and thinking about, you know, how God forgives our sins and whatnot. And I thought, well, maybe that'll, that'll be good to preach. And so I thought I'd kind of build up to it. And the building up to it ended up being the sermon instead of Daniel, instead of the 70 weeks. Before we get to the 70 weeks, we're going to talk about the 70 years, all right? And I'll explain to you what that means here in a little bit. Does everybody have your Bible there? Daniel chapter 9, say amen. 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 You'll need your Bible open, because you know me, I like to put verses on the screen that I know for a fact you can't read sitting where you are. So I'm going to make you open your Bible up, all right? <laughs> Daniel chapter 9, here's what the Bible said. you believe the Bible this morning? Yeah. I hope so. And uh, let me just say this, as we read it, I want you to consider that this passage, there, there are two groups of people that the Bible talks to, saved people and lost people. This passage here, I don't really think God is speaking primarily to lost people. Now, if you're here today, or you're listening, watching online, and you're lost. You don't know what that means? That means you're don't, you don't think you're going to heaven. You're not sure. Okay? It's not about how good you are. It's not about your good deeds outweighing your bad deeds. If that's your thought, I tell you, you got a false balance. And a false balance is an abomination to God. God hates it. You put your good deeds up against your bad deeds. And the Bible says that in the day that a righteous man commits iniquity, all of his righteousnesses are gone. That's Ezekiel 33. You go look it up. So if you want to weigh your good deeds against your bad deeds, the moment you do a bad deed, you're, there are no good deeds to weigh. They've been all taken away. And so, as it is, we stand before God bankrupt. We have no righteousness with which to please God with. We must rely upon the righteousness of Jesus Christ and Him alone. So if you're lost today, and you realize that you need to be saved, I'm going to tell you, listen to this message. I'm tell you, listen, because this will show you, this will help you with knowing that your sins can be forgiven. But if you are here today, you're listening today, and you consider yourself part of the church of Jesus Christ, you know you're saved, you're born again, you believe the Bible, you believe that the Holy Ghost dwells in you, then this is who Daniel 9, as far as what I can see, this is who it's targeting. So what, I, what I'm asking you to do, in fact, I'm not asking you, I'm telling you. As any message is preached, it is the wrong thing to do to lay the Word of God over against somebody else before you lay it on yourself. It is the absolute wrong thing to do to do because what happens is then you'll neglect the impact of the word of God in your life and you'll just be thinking that it's for everybody else and it has no relevance to you move on and what you like is for me to preach about what everybody else is doing but every now and then we got to preach on what we're doing or not doing amen that's what makes a healthy church so consider that as we read this all right Daniel chapter 9 verse 1. In the first year of Darius the son of Ahasuerus of the seed of the Medes which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans 
In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years whereof the, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Judah. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. Daniel said that he understood by the books that they were going to be in captivity for 70 years. Quick, look at me, don't look at your Bible. What book did he hear that from? Who said Jeremiah? You get a free DVD, Ian. Okay? Go to Walmart and tell them that. Okay? You get a free video over at Walmart. Anyway, yeah, he said Jeremiah here. All right, so guess what we're going to do? We're going to turn to Jeremiah 25. Turn your Bible there. Jeremiah 25. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? Daniel is in, is part of fulfillment of Bible prophecy. Daniel is. Daniel is in Babylonian captivity. And he's asking God to show him how long he's going to be there. How long he's going to have to endure this. How long he's going to have to be a part of this. It is possible. I can't say that it, I know it for sure. But it is possible that Daniel survived the whole 70 years captivity and actually got to see the day when Israel was returned back to Jerusalem. If he was in that, if Daniel was in that group, which we know he was, that went into captivivity, Nebuchadnezzar picked him along with uh, Hananiah, and Mishael, and Azariah, that's their Hebrew names. We know that Daniel was a young man at that time. We don't know exactly how young he was, but we know that he was considered as a young man. And it's possible that if Daniel was maybe in his teens or early 20s, that he would have been alive at the time the captivity ended and they got to go back to Jerusalem. They were there 70 years. Daniel may have been 85, 90 years, something like that, and may have gotten retired. I don't know that for sure, but just may have. But the thing I want you to keep in mind is Daniel is reading in the Bible about himself. He's reading Bible prophecy and understanding that that prophecy applied to him in his day. And I want you to consider that this morning. Again, I don't want you to stick this on anybody else. I want you to put it on you. Alright? And I want you to think about what, what we're going to read this morning. Jeremiah chapter 25. Are you there? Say amen. This is what, I want you to understand it the way Daniel's seeing it. He's in captivity. And he's understanding not only the years of the captivity, but why they were in captivity to begin with. Jeremiah chapter 25 verse 3. From the thirteenth year of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, even unto this day, that is the three and twentieth year, the word of the Lord hath come unto me, and I have spoken unto you, rising early and speaking, but ye have not hearkened. Remember, this is you. Ten years. He said, ten years. From the thirteenth year of Josiah to the twenty-third year, I've been, Jeremiah says, I've been preaching to you the word of the Lord. I've been rising up early and preaching it to you. You have not hearkened to it. God said it. You didn't listen. You didn't hear it. You didn't obey it. You didn't give heed to the warning that God gave. God is warning people. God is still warning people. To this day, God is warning people. People don't want to listen. They don't want to hear. And the sad thing about it is... It's not necessarily the lost people that don't want to hear. It's the church crowd that doesn't want to hear. What a shame to be sitting in the house of God. To be sitting in a church where they preach the word of God. And you don't want to hear it. What a shame. To, to neglect parts of the Bible that you say, well that doesn't really apply to me and won't apply to me. Or to neglect parts of the Bible simply because your actions and your deeds, the things that you either have done or are doing right now, say, 
well, if I say that that's right, then that means that I'm wrong and i got to stop doing what I'm doing. And who wants to do that? I mean, who wants to be living a certain way and thinking a certain way, living a certain lifestyle, and then they hear the Word of God preached or they read it themselves and they say, well, if I admit that that's right, then I, I've got to change what I'm doing and I don't want to do that. What a shame. Do you know, there's preachers who preach this book and don't want to listen to it. There are church people who read this book, say amen to the messages, and don't want to live by it. You think God's happy with that? You think God's satisfied with churches and church people who say amen to the messages, have a big old King James Bible in front of them, and not give heed to what God said? Do you think God's happy about that? No, He's not. So he says in verse 4, And the Lord has sent unto you all his servants the prophets. Now I want you to underline that in your Bible. Where it says all his servants the prophets. And if you make notes in the margin, you can write down 66 books. That's how many books there are in the Bible. 66 books. All his servants the prophets from Genesis to Revelation. The Lord has sent unto you all his servants, the prophets. Do we not believe that we have a complete Bible? Do we believe that? We believe that we have that we don't need 67 books. We don't need 70. And we won't put up with 65 or less. We have 66 books. They are the complete written record of God's Word, everything that God has to say to us, He's saying to us in His Word. Am I right? But you have not hearkened nor inclined your ear to hear. Verse 5, they said, Turn ye again now, everyone from his evil way. This is what the Bible says. This is what the prophet said. Turn ye again now, everyone from his evil way and from the evil of your doing." And dwell in the land that the Lord hath given unto you and to your fathers forever and ever. You love this church? Do you love this church? I love this church. I want to stay here. I don't want to leave. I don't want to have to leave. I don't want to be run off, forced out, starved out, prayed out. Leave in humiliation. I don't want to go anywhere else except here. But it's possible. If I don't listen to the Word of God, even while I'm preaching it, it's very possible. God showed me that a long time ago, people. Mike, I brought you into this church. You don't deserve it. And I'll take you out. God told me that, and He'll tell you that. This is a good church. This is a good church. What makes you think you deserve it? There isn't anything that God has done here that is great and tremendous and fascinating and holy and awesome and righteous that you and I deserve being a part of this, and yet God brought us in here. And I'm telling this is the land that God has given us, is it not? If there was something better for you, I encourage you to go find it. And I'm not being facetious either. I'm not trying to be mean. But what I'm telling you is, this is the land that God has given us to dwell in. This is an awesome place. There are people who have moved here to be part of this. There are others out there who would give anything to be able to come here and visit here. I know of families right now that are trying to raise the money just to come and visit here. And they're having a hard time doing it because they don't, they don't do so well in life. And I'm telling you that God could take any one of us out for disobedience. And we would have it coming. 
Turn ye again now, everyone, from his evil way, and turn from the evil of your doings, and dwell in the land that the Lord hath given unto you and to your fathers forever and ever. And go not after other gods to serve them and to worship them. And provoke me not to anger with the works of your hands, and I will do you no hurt. Yet ye have not hearkened unto me, saith the Lord, that ye might provoke me to anger with the works of your hands, to your own hurt. The works of your own hands. Is a God. I was teaching about this in Sunday school. It is a God. That you created. That allows you. To get by with. What you're getting by with. That's the, that's the work of your own hand. It is the God. That lets you get by with. What you're getting by with. I don't know what it is. And if you think I'm preaching because I know what everybody's guilty of and I'm trying to nail you to the wall, you're crazy. I don't want to preach stuff like this. It's got to be preached every now and then. Does it not? You guys pay me to say what God says. If I don't say it, don't pay me. But I have to say it whether I'm guilty of it or you're guilty of it. And whatever it is that we're guilty of, that's between you and God. I don't want to know about it unless you just feel like you have to tell me. But it is between you and God. I'm not your priest. Don't confess your sins to me. And I won't confess mine to you. Amen? Amen. But there's, a, there's just an honest deal that God has with His people. If you'll hearken unto me, which means even if you do wrong, confess it. Own up to it. Admit it. You did wrong. We all have. Let's get it confessed. Let's get it under the blood. And let's move on. That's part of it. But God makes a very simple deal. You want to dwell in the land? You want to be part of God's kingdom? Do what God says. That's where you work has rules just like that. How you doing, Jody? Good to be here, isn't it? Okay. Does your job have rules? Lots of them. She's a government, I almost said worker, but she's a government worker. Her job has rules. The rules say do it our way or hit the highway. Right? Are they right in doing that? It's their highway. They can say what they want. I don't, care if it, I don't care if you work at McDonald's. You cook burgers the way McDonald's says to cook burgers. And if you want to cook them the way Hardee's does it, then go to Hardee's. Amen? It's a different way. But God has rules. God has ways that He wants us to live. And we're going to find out from His Word that they're not hurt for, God's not trying to hurt us. He's trying to help us. Amen? Let Him help. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, help. Help me. Lord, I know, God, that I can get in my flesh. I don't want to do that. I love these people. I don't want to be their adversary. I don't want to be their enemy. I want to be their advocate. I want to be their friend. I want to be their brother. Their counselor, their help, their leader, their servant. I want, God, what you want out of this place. I want it out of me. Father, I know, Lord, how hard it is to get it out of me. So, Lord, I understand them and I care about them. So, Lord, help me to preach this right. Help me to preach it in love. I pray, dear God, Lord, I, I do not, God. You know my heart. I have no idea, Lord, why this message today. So, Father, I ask, God, that you take control, that you lead, that you guide. Lord God, that you continue on in this place what you're doing. Because, Father, I love it. I love the work that you've given me to do. I love, Father, the 
the challenge. I love the, the benefits. I love the joy, dear God, that I see in people's faces. I love the, the lives that are changed. Lord, I just, I love it, God, and I don't want you to stop doing it here because we won't listen. God, it would be wrong for us to send out a strong message to the rest of the world and then us neglect it. So, Father, your word says judgment begins at the house of God. And so, Father, I pray, dear God, that judgment would begin here. And Father, help each one of us, Lord, in our lives to listen to you today as you speak to us, Lord, on where we're not hearing you. It's not if we're not hearing you, God. It's where we're not hearing you. God, just be kind to us. Be gentle on us, God. Show us the right way, God, and we'll follow in it. Or, Father, we understand and we know the consequences. Bless your word in our hearts. We pray this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. Now, we're going to continue reading. And there's some things here in verse 10 that I'm going to preach on. Okay? The heart of the message is yet to come. But God was showing me this and... What a, I'm just, I'm awed at how God is the one that lays out the message before I ever get there. And when I read it, I'm just going, well, there's the message right there. If we pick it up in verse 8, I want you to give heed now to the Word of God this morning. This was a warning to the people living in Jerusalem. God was warning them that if they didn't straighten their ways out, that He was going to send Nebuchadnezzar out. And grab them out of their land and take them out and put them in bondage. He was going to put them there for 70 years. Now Daniel is the one where this thing started. Because when I started this, it was in Daniel. And Daniel said, I was reading Jeremiah and he's the one that said 70 years. And so I understood how long we were going to be there. And I understood why we were going to be there. And if you keep reading in Daniel 9 you'll see that Daniel's prayer that he prayed addressed everything that God said here in Jeremiah 25. It was Daniel, listen to me now, it was Daniel confessing the sins of his people as well as his own. Now hear me out in this, okay? I'm going to give us just a minute here. I love this church. And there are times when our church needs prayed for. And there are times that we collectively pray to God and say, God, forgive me. But God, also forgive my church. Forgive my people. And this is our people. Amen? I mean, we, we are just alike in, in many, many, many ways. We have our unique differences. We have our, our collective agreements. And it's those agreements that bind us and tie us together. And I don't, I don't want to be without anybody. And I wouldn't mind God sending a few more our way. But we have to pray, number one, for ourselves. Number two, pray for our church. And that doesn't mean that you've got to be the busybody and try to find out what everybody in church is doing so you can pray about it. So watch this in verse 8. Therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts, because ye have not heard my words. Listen to what God's going to do now. Behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, saith the Lord, and Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, I will bring them against this land. Now think of this land now. Think of it as, number one, you can think of it as America. And God's going to come and get us one of these days. Who believes that? Say amen. It's a sh Let me just say this. It is a shame. When they, I don't know if you saw the news this morning. They rallied in protest against the President of the United States for keeping the law. That's a shame. 
That's a shame and a reproach to any people. Okay? But you can this could this could be for our country. This could be for our community. This could be for our church. And this definitely could be for our homes. And you ponder that for a while. Therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, because ye have not heard my word. Behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, saith the Lord, and Nebuchadrezzar, king of Babylon, my servant, and will bring them against this land and against the inhabitants thereof and against all those nations round about and will utterly destroy them and make them an astonishment and an hissing and perpetual desolations. God could destroy this nation so bad that no one ever lived in it ever again. There is a volcano in Yellowstone called a caldera. You ever heard of that? It's a mega volcano. It is many, many, many miles wide and it's just sitting underneath the surface of the earth. And they say if it decides to blow, it will literally destroy most things living in this nation. God could do it in one day. You believe that? Mount St. Helens was a water gun compared to this. God can do it. God could unleash, let's see, he said he's going to bring them out of the north, right? God could empower North Korea and destroy this nation. God could do it. And nobody would live here forever. No one calls Sodom their hometown anymore. No one lives there. God can do it here. God could take this church and make it such a reproach to the people in this community and around the world that no one would ever come to this church ever again. God could do that. God could take your home and send devils in and make it a desolation, a desolate house. God could do that with your life as well. Nobody would ever want to be around you the rest of your life because of what you've done. You see, again, this sermon is not to all these people up here at the tavern and the VFW hall and over here at Walmart, and the people at the lake. It's not to them, it's to us. And I am not the one who is aware of your life and where your disobedience is. I am not the one who knows that. You are. You and God. I'm just telling you what God said He would do. So now, if you're here today... And things are pretty good between you and God. Then I would say, make notes on this and remember it. Because it won't be that way six months from now, a year from now. Amen? You'll be the one that needs to hear this sermon again. Pray we get it online so you can go listen to it a month from now. Amen? So anyway, verse 10. This is what I'm going to preach on today. Moreover, I will take from them, this is what God will take. Number one, the voice of mirth. I'm going to explain to you what that is. Number two, the voice of gladness. Number three, the voice of the bridegroom. Number four, the voice of the bride. Number six, the sound of the millstones. Number seven, the light of the candle. That's what God said He was going to take. In verse 11, he said, This whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. That's what Daniel read. Daniel, when he read that, he not only, again, like I say, he was not only reading how long they were going to be there, he was reading why they were there. And why they were there is because the Jews had a Bible and they wouldn't listen to it. They had a Bible that God gave them the oracles. God gave us here the authorized 1611 
King James preserved Word of God hadn't changed it in 405 years. Been the same Bible ever since then. Same Bible that my granddaddy preached out of. Same Bible that our forefathers read as they moved across this country. God has given us His Word and yet there are things in it that we don't listen to. How long? You have to ask yourself the question. Number one, how long is God going to long suffer with us while we disobey Him? How long is God going to do that? How long is God going to tarry and not get us for what we've done or what we're doing while we just let things slip and say, well, God will forgive me. Meanwhile, we know to do right and we don't do it. Paul said, that's a sin. Amen? So let's look at it. Number one, the voice of mirth. Mirth is joyful songs. Here's what the Bible says. Psalm 137, 3. For there they that carried us away captive required of us a song, and they that wasted us required of us mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. So God said, for your disobedience and for not hearkening, for not listening to the Word, for saying, well, the preacher's just preaching, or, you know, I, I was listening to Brother Reg, and, you know, that's his opinion, but I just, don't, I just don't go for some of that stuff. For listening to the Word of God and then not doing the Word of God, God said, I'm going to take away all your good music out of your church. Who in here ever went to a church that you sing the old hymns and all of a sudden they snapped one day and they got in something new and they started singing all these praise and worship songs? We had a bunch of people that follow us online that refuse to go to church anywhere because they will not sing the old time hymns. Think about this, amazing grace. When we all get to heaven, victory in Jesus. I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. The unclouded day. Little as much when God is in it. When the roll is called up yonder. Onward Christian soldiers. Jesus saves. Leaning on the everlasting arms. And on and on and on and on. We've got what? 800 pages of good old gospel music. God will take them out just like that. And watch this now. Here's what will happen. This is what happens to people who are backsliding. They quit singing gospel music in their car. They don't, they quit as they're vacuuming the house. They're not singing Rock of Ages, Clef for Me. Now they're singing Katy Perry and Madonna. Man, I don't even know who else. Jay-Z? Beyonce? Bouncy? Queers? Sodomites? Fornicators? Dopeheads and drunkards? Country music? Rock music? Pop music? Rap music? Rhythm and blues, you name it. That's all you listen to now. What's God done? God's taken away the voice of mirth out of your life. Why? You ain't going to listen to Him to begin with. So the first thing that God did is God took your music away. Am I telling the truth? Who in here knows about backsliding? What's the first thing that goes? What's the first thing that the devil moves in to your ears? Edward, you said it. You testified in this church that in your community, it's the music that's telling them to pick up their guns and shoot one another. And how many died last night in St. Louis? Did you hear? Four or five people got shot all at once. A car full of people the, the, the child just died. I saw the picture of the little girl this morning. I wanted to weep. She looked as cute as Michaela. She was about her age. Her mom got shot. Her dad got shot. She got shot. And they all ended up dying. 
and it was the music. First thing that happens, people backslide people, I'm telling you. We pop those headphones in, pull that phone out, and start listening to junk. Don't we? It's the first thing that goes. God said it. God said I'll take away the voice of mirth. So if you're in that position right now, if I were you, I would stop. And I would get on my face before God and say, God, before this goes any further, put back the music back in my heart. And then you're back singing Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound. That saved a wretch like me. I once was lost and now I'm found was blind and now I'm saying, you see, it don't bother you now to sing that in Walmart. Amen? Yeah. And when that thug pulls up with a stereo set as big as a truck next to you at the stoplight, pounding Jay-Z out the speakers, you turn on your cassette player in your car and play some old time gospel music. Amen? Southern raised. I'm going to tell him you said that. Second thing is gone. is voice of gladness. God takes away the voice of gladness out of your heart. Psalm 46, 4. There's a river. The streams whereof shall make glad the city of God. The holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. You know what he did? He dammed up the river that made you glad. Psalm 119, 74. They that fear thee will be glad when they see me because I have hoped in thy word. Psalm 122, 1. I was glad when they said unto me. Watch this. What is it that brings gladness? I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Music. Gone. First thing that's gone is the music. Second thing. Church attendance. Being at church doesn't make you glad anymore. So you quit going. This is not my first trip around the boulevard, people. I've been in church most of my life. I have been in. I have been out. I have seen people come in and go out. I've seen people backslide. I've backslid. And I'm telling you, music changes. And then all of a sudden, you don't feel like sitting here past 12 o'clock. You don't feel like sitting here at all. You used to come Sunday school, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Bible conference, homecoming, you used to come to it all. And then you don't come. God took away the voice of gladness out of your heart. You're not glad when they said, come on, let's go to the house of the Lord. I don't feel good today. All right? Any little thing in the world comes up and all of a sudden you can't come to church. But that same little thing comes up and you can go to work or you can go to the store or you can go here or you can go there. But not church. And I'm not, listen, I'm not giving you the cause of what God's doing in your life. I'm giving you the results of the cause is there was something about God that you weren't listening to when He was trying to talk to you. He sent you 66 books of the Bible to gather from in your life and you decided not to listen to it. So God changed your music and then God changed your church attendance habits. The voice of the bridegroom. For this cause shall a man leave his father and his mother shall be joined into his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Christ is the bridegroom. Psalm 19.4, Their line has gone throughout all the earth, and all their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the Son, which is as a bridegroom, coming out of his chamber. And rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from the end of heaven and his circuit unto the ends of it. And there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. The law of the Lord is perfect. See how he connected it? The voice of the bridegroom is the preaching of God's word. This is Sunday. Look out there. See that sun? Isn't that bright and pretty? 
God all of a sudden, instead of you walking in light, you're in darkness. And it's not that I quit preaching. It's you quit hearing. And you were listening to sermon audio. You were listening to preachers there. You are listening to YouTube preachers. And now all of a sudden you're not listening to them anymore. You're watching TV and doing, uh, what is that, binge watching? Watch a whole season of a show on the internet. Won't hear, well, you don't want to hear no preaching. God took the voice of the bridegroom away from you. Took it away. I got to preach this to myself. God would change my preaching. And you would know it. Because if it was me that was backslid, I wouldn't be preaching this stuff. And I definitely wouldn't be saying it about me. God would take away... See, my whole ministry is preaching and teaching. Eight times a week. God would fix that to where I wouldn't want to do it anymore. voice of the bride you know who that is I John saw the holy city New Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven prepared as a bride adorned for her husband Revelation 22 17 here's, here's what the voice of the bride says the spirit and the bride say come you know what that is that is a church invitation to lost people saying come and let him that hears say, Come, and let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. See, along with church attendance, get ready for this one. Somebody in the church notices you gone. And whereas before they might have called or they might have emailed you or sent you a text saying, hey, we missed you Sunday, and you would have said, Yeah, I know, listen, I just I'm running some things, I couldn't get there. I'm going to do everything I can to be there next Sunday. You pray for me. See, you still listen to them. But then when God takes away the voice of the bride, somebody sends you a message from the church and you're going, Boy, I wish they'd mind their own business. I wish they'd leave me alone. If I want to go back to that church, I'll go to that church. I don't need them bothering me all the time. Listen, I've run into people. I've had people so hateful. Just because you said to them, hey, I missed you in church. What business is that of yours? You know what? God just took away from them the voice of the bride. But you look around this building. These are the best people in your life right now. And you're going to lose them for some stupid sin? By the way, Losing the voice of the bride and the bridegroom together. You know what that is? What have we lost out of this nation? Godly marriage. The voice of the bride and the bridegroom in this country has been taken out. Those who believe in biblical marriage no longer have a voice in this country. Out of all the things I like out of the president right now, we don't even have one who will support traditional marriage. He made that plain. The sound of the millstones. Deuteronomy 24, 6. I want you to notice this. No man shall take the nether or the upper millstone to pledge, for he taketh a man's life to pledge. Now let me tell you what that means. The millstone was one of the most important things that a man could have because when he sowed his seed and brought in his grain that corn and that wheat was useless if he couldn't grind it he had to grind it to make his bread or to make bread or whatever for his cattle whatever he had to grind it and God said do not the pledge meant collateral do not loan somebody money and then say 
I'll take your millstone as collateral. And if you don't pay the debt, I'm going to take your millstone away from you. God said, you're taking that man's life away. Isaiah 47, 2. Take the millstones and grind meal. The millstone is there. Here's, here's the seed of the Word of God. You know what the millstone does? It breaks it down so that you can eat it and live off of it. You know what God's saying here? You walk, Listen to me. You remember that day? Who in it? Raise your hand now. You had one of those days where you're reading the Bible and all of a sudden God showed you something. And I mean, you just, hair stood up on the back of your neck, tears come out of your eyes, and you just went, Woo! And you were all by yourself and you were going, Oh, that's so sweet! Who in there had a, had a time like that? God will take that away. God will take your millstone away. And all of a sudden, you know what happened? You'll read this Bible, and to you, it's just junk. It makes no, it doesn't make any sense. All of a sudden, you're not getting anything. Do listen? Do you think that I don't know what I'm talking about standing up here? Did you not know that I have times when I read this Bible and I'll go, I don't, I don't know what that means. I don't get nothing out of that. And that's when it starts getting scary. And I say, God, please, don't take the millstone away from me. God, don't take away you showing me things out of your word. I can't take that. Last one. Light of the candle. Um, turn to Revelation 18. While I'm preaching this, and I'm going to be done. Job 18.6, the light shall be dark in his tabernacle and his candle shall be put out with him. Job 21.17 How off is the candle of the wicked put out? Proverbs 20 The spirit of man is the candle of the Lord and searching all the inward parts of the belly. Proverbs 24.20 For there shall be no reward to the evil man the candle of the wicked shall be put out. There is a light inside of you that God put in you. It is the light that can search the Bible and understand it. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The candlestick in the house of God was the set, represented the seven spirits of God. Remember what David prayed in Psalm 51 concerning his sin with Bathsheba? Take not thine Holy Spirit from me. Sounds to me like David remembered what happened with Saul. And the two things you had going for you is prayer and Bible reading. Now you don't you don't give a flip about your Bible anymore. You don't read it. It is nothing to you because God blew the candle out. In um, Revelation chapter 18, let me see if I can find this very quick. Oh, let's see here. Took your candle out. Yeah. Verse 22, Revelation 18, 22. Or excuse me, verse 23. And the light of a candle shall shine no more at all in thee, and the voice of the bridegroom and in the voice of the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee, for thy merchants, for the great men of the earth, for thy sorceries, where all nations deceived. You know what you turn into? Babylon. You turn into Babylon. And there is a danger that these things are gone, people, and they won't come back. Who wants that? I don't. I mean, I've, I've had times where one of these things have happened to me. And it scared me. And I said, God, I don't want that. And God says, Mike, then why don't you listen to what I'm telling you? Quit being rebellious. Quit telling me no. And I'll restore the candle back. I'll give you your millstone back. I'll give you your church back. I'll give you everything back. But you're going to listen to me. You're going to, you're going to do it how I say to do it. And you're going to live how I say to live. And see, that's what God was doing here in Jeremiah. And that's why Daniel, when he was reading it, God's judgment against 
Jerusalem was only temporary. It was 70 years and then it was to be over with. Now listen to me. When God told Jeremiah 70 years and Daniel read 70 years, do you know how long it was? How long was it? It was 70 years. Did you know that even though Daniel prayed, God did not shorten what he said? And let me tell you something. You may still have to go through some earthly consequences as a result of your disobedience to God because God said, this is what I'm going to do. And you're going to have to take it no matter what. God did not bend or alter the word that went out of his mouth simply because Daniel prayed and his prayer was heard, it was received, but it was still 70 years. Do you get that? If God said, this is what I'm going to do to you, then he's going to do it. Repent or not, he's still going to do it. But getting that, notice in this whole list here, God never said, well, for doing this, I'm going to, at the end of 70 years, I'm just going to send you to hell. How's that? That's not what God said. God said, at the end of 70 years, I'm going to restore you. But it's going to be 70 years. Now, you listen to me. You may, have, you may have had somebody tell you, oh, once you repent, then God makes it all right. and You don't have to do anything after that. It's all, it's all fine after that. I don't believe that for one second. If God tells you that I'm going to do this to you, now you better repent. You repent. God's still going to do it. Now listen, I told my mama, Mama, this time I'm really sorry. And my mama said, you better believe you're going to be. I was sorry. And she gave it to me anyway. Do you know why? She said she was going to. I'm done. I'm done preaching. I love you. So I want you to bow your head. And I'm not going to say anything. I'm not going to try to coach you and come down the altar. I'm not going to try to hit you with stuff. This was, I have no idea who this was for. Maybe me. Maybe you. Maybe all of us and we don't realize it. But I want to tell you something. This word, this Bible, you say, you say we believe the Bible? Then we better start believing it. It would not be right for us to have this preached to us think that it was for everybody that was online it didn't have anything to do with us and think that we can get by with stuff that everybody else they have to, they have to listen to it your head bowed I went to a church one time visiting a church who was on vacation and they had one of their big praise and worship song leaders boy he was putting on a big show up there and then it was time for the preacher to preach. So the preacher got up there preaching. Well, I didn't really see what happened to this big song leader. Caleb was little. He had to go to the bathroom. So I got up there in the sermon, took him out to the bathroom. There was the song leader with all the musicians out in the foyer just having a little chat, cutting up, having a good time out there. God gave me some wisdom on that. Mike? They think that they don't have to listen to the word because they're the song leaders. And what a shame. So let's not think that God's going to let us get by with anything while He goes and gets everybody else. And if God's taken away the mirth, He's going to take away the gladness next. He's going to take away the bridegroom and the bride. Don't let him do it. 